Earlier tonight, I had the opportunity to have a full conversation with Jeremy Lefebvre. He's an OG in the YouTube investor community. I was watching his videos before I was even making videos of my own, particularly with Tesla in 2018, 2019, at when he was invested in the stock. As you know, I was invested in Tesla in 2019 as well. And in this conversation, we talked about a ton of topics, including SoFi, Palantir, PayPal, Revolve, Corsair, Apple, the market in 2024 in general. We talked about Bitcoin. We talked about things to look out for and even some of Jeremy's short positions on the market. This is the full video I've edited and added timestamps. Enjoy. Jeremy, first of all, thank you so much for being on the channel. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, thanks for having me on, man. I'm always always down to chat stock. So uh, I'm excited about your channel. I'm definitely, you know, trying to draw some more attention to, you know, a lot of the up and coming channels. I feel like you got one of those channels and uh, yeah, man, exciting times. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting into everything, talking a lot of stocks. So. All right. Question number one. Why are you not invested in SoFi yet? <laughs> Yeah, tough decision. So it's interesting. Right SoFi, literally last night, I was uh, looking into potentially uh, creating my first SoFi account, actually. I'm looking at them for uh, either doing maybe a CD, but probably a savings account uh, with okay. SoFi because I like to have my money kind of spread around a little bit, especially after what happened with some of the regional banks and whatnot. You never know. And so uh, I was thinking about putting like 50K in, in SoFi savings. And so I'm probably going to create an account with SoFi. going to experience a product maybe over this next few months. It's one thing to like look at a company and, you know, read about it and, oh, they got all these different things. It's another to kind of like get into the product, experience it. How do they reach out? Emails, upsell like all those sorts of things. I'm really interested to kind of become a customer and see how things go there. But bottom line, obviously, is not in a good place still. Uh, it might get in a better place uh, soon. I think I was already in too many bottom line bad companies to begin with. Certainly going into last year, I was not in a good position, like, you know, 21 into 2022. And so I'm really trying to watch risk exposures in terms of like new stocks that are, let's call it money losers on the bottom line. That's really what it comes down to. But we'll see once I experience the product, if their financials start coming around, especially with student loans coming back. And I think it definitely has potential, but we'll see. It also really comes down to when it comes to SoFi, how is it going to be valued long term? And I think that's a question I'm still trying to figure out. Is this going to be valued like a bank? Because banks trade at 10, 11, 12 P's, 8 P's, like it's a joke, right? Um, right. If SoFi is going to trade like that, then... You know, it's going to be tough sledding for years, but, you know, if it trades like a high growth company, there's obviously room for multiple expansion. Okay. So first, let me start off by saying that, you know, I've been following your channel for a while, even before I was making content of my own. So I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with the style of, I got to get to know the product. First and foremost, myself, I come from a product management background. That's what I do in my day job, working in the tech space as a product manager and just validating what the user experience is and how we can optimize that. So I totally get that aspect. Unfortunately, being in Canada, I can't really try SoFi's product myself. I have played around with the app, but I can't open you know, an app. I think the savings account is really the tantalizing first value proposition just because of the APY that it offers. So that's going to be good. And I'm actually curious to see if you're going to cross buy into something like even low stakes, like a relay or something like that. But, you know, I think the profitability point is huge. And that's why a lot of institutions are staying out. That's why a lot of analysts are, you know, downgrading the stock or maybe not as bullish as they should be on the stock on just the growth prospects alone, not even the member growth, the revenue growth, but the cross selling flywheel, like the moat that they have formed across all of these different product lines and how synergistic they are together. Even if it is as a form of of reducing your APY, they have an entire tech platform where they can vertically integrate and do that. But the street is really looking at bottom line and it sounds like you're fairly the same, but is that simply a number of, you know, let's say Q4, once they hit that profitability at the end of this year, when they report in January, is that the thing that, you know, you see positive EPS on the bottom line, or do you want to see it for several quarters or what's your thinking around that? Once it gets super close to that flipping or once they officially flip, I think that will be a big moment. And then, then it's about kind of, for me, projecting out like what I expect that net income to go up over the future years. Cause I also have to have a strong opinion of that. If right. I'm kind of like still in a place of like cluelessness, like, I don't know, like, uh, are they going to do 50 million a quarter, hundred million dollars in net income a quarter. That's the other component I got to figure out there. Cause then I can work backwards, you know, cause I'll create five different cases. Usually when I invest in a stock, I have a super bearish case, uh, a super bullish case, a bullish case, bearish case, and like, like a base case. Right? right. And I've got to be able to at least, you know, on an educated guess of what I think they're, 
their potential five-year out net incomes can be, revenues can be. Once I can do that, then I can work backwards and be like, oh, I'm paying this sort of market cap for this. And so that goes back to like Tesla back in the day. Right. You know, I invested in Tesla when it was seen as a very, very risky company back in, I think it was 2018, 2019. Right. But I was able to run numbers and projections about like, I think they can sell this many cars at this price. I think they'll have gross margins of this as they, you know, reach uh, scale and whatnot. And I was able to work backwards. And, you know, at that time, I think Tesla was trading out like a $40 billion market cap or $30 billion or something like that and uh, work backwards and be like, oh my gosh, based upon where I think this company's net income is going five years out, this is a steel deal. Right. I've got to be able to do that with SoFi. If I can't do that with SoFi, then it remains one of those stocks I'm kind of just keeping an eye on, but don't own. So. so let me push back on that a little bit, because for example, just Tesla, since you brought it up, when you invested in Tesla, they weren't bottom line profitable at that point. And so there was some forecasting that went into what is their future growth going to look like in terms of when they turn into that profitability. Because one of the points that you know I want to make sort of as a counterpoint is by the time they print positive on the bottom line, the word is out. The stock has already pumped. Like you saw with Palantir, for example, it went from seven to like 18 based on two court, like the street, that's what they're waiting for. And that's when they pile in. So you want to be able to front run that. You said profitability for SoFi, and I totally respect that. But that's a rule that you've broken for Tesla. So is it just the market environment is different today than it was in 2018, 2019? So, I mean, interest rates are certainly in a little bit of a different, a different place uh, now. But I think the main thing is with Tesla, I could run my projections and feel confident that right. these projections are somewhat realistic. With SoFi, I'm not there yet okay. where I can run projections three years out, five years out and be like, I think this is what they're doing. That's another part that keeps me on the sideline. It's like got battered last year, plus you add on top, like, ah, I'm not too sure about myself yet. And that could change, you know, three months could go by and then I have a better grip of the company and I have a better understanding of here's where I think they're going. I've listened to the last several conference calls of SoFi and uh, the conference calls have actually impressed me quite a bit. I mean, when I first started hearing about the company and looking into it, I thought, oh, you know, this must be some app that, you know, kind of like a Robin Hood type deal, like, oh, right. it must be one of kids. And then you kind of find out about the credit scores and people have phenomenal credit scores that use SoFi and right. uh, the average net worth and those sorts of things and average incomes in it. Yeah, it slowly starts to win you over. It's just got to be able to project out those numbers. So. so let me dig a little bit deeper into that. You said that with Tesla, you became increasingly confident in the fact that they would continue on this growth trajectory and eventually hit that profitability. What was the thing that made you more confident in terms of your understanding and overall, just in terms of your willingness to go in, even though they were unprofitable? Like, is it just trying yeah. out the product and you think your opinion is going to change after you get, you know, the savings product or something else? There's a lot of factors that went into Tesla, but the overwhelming biggest factor was uh, Sandy Monroe. And okay. Sandy Monroe, yeah, very, you know, obviously uh, some people might know him, some people might not, but like a car expert and breaking down cars. And I remember this was either 2018 or 2019, but he broke down the Model 3. And he was going into the Model 3 in terms of how smart Tesla was doing everything and how, you know, they were integrating everything into one screen versus all these other companies were trying to do all these buttons and just causing a lot of confusion. And he went into a few different other parts. It was at that moment where you have an actual expert in that industry. He was basically saying, like, Tesla's going to end up, once they get to scale, this is going to be a far more profitable vehicle than, you know, anything we're really used to. And so when you hear an expert say something like that, and he was talking about the margins back then and those sorts of things, like the margins Tesla can hit, that's when you can start to become a little more confident and then start to project some numbers. And you add a few things on top of that. But that was the overwhelming thing for me personally, that I was like, oh, wow, like Tesla is onto something. Okay. So what do you think will be the equivalent of that for SoFi, let's say? Is it just more due diligence? Is it, you know, you want to come on SoFi weekly one week and we can, we can pitch it to you? Or what do you that think? Might be that might be interesting. It might have to go on SoFi Weekly uh, one week, but yeah, that might be helpful and just more DD in general, uh, I think would be helpful to kind of get to a place where, you know, I can figure out, okay, SoFi is a steel deal here or no, it's not as much of a deal as, as people might think. So I, cause I, right now I'm, I can't say either way. Well, by the way, why is SoFi not in Canada? What's going on with that? Man, Canada is so oligopolized, especially from a banking and telco perspective. It's, restrictive of free competition and it's mm -hmm. ridiculous from a consumer because you have these oligopolies just jacking up prices and cornering the market. Dang, okay. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, for I, if I were SoFi and I, I would say, okay, you have a population of what, like 35 million and you have all of these regulations and the government is stifling, you, like the juice is not worth the squeeze. Why would we expand there? Yeah, 100%. Yep. Is SoFi interesting going to any new markets anytime soon? Because I don't remember hearing anything on the latest conference calls unless I missed it. So Latinam is always a big focus. They also have licenses for Hong Kong and UAE. Dubai is a big area where big money is. 
uh, mm -hmm. for them to expand. But their acquisition of Technicis back in 2021 helps them cross sell into Latin America. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Jeremy, if you think of the market penetration just in the US alone, SoFi is a company that has like 6 million members and a population of like, what, 350 million people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They have so small. much people. Why would they focus on international when they literally have the entire US market just there? Yeah, 100%. Let's pivot off of SoFi. What do you think is the biggest opportunity in the market right now? Is it PayPal? Whew, uh, I think PayPal is the easiest money in the market. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of opportunities, obviously, in the market, and they all come with different risk profiles. There's some that you know are super risky stocks that, yeah, they have 10x type opportunities, but they take an immense amount of risk. PayPal is one of those stocks that I just look at, and I'm just like, if I have money in that stock for the next three, five years, I'm not worried at all. You know, can it go down? Sure. All stocks can go down. But looking at the valuation, looking at the growth rates, looking at all the different growth levers they have for not just revenue, but really the bottom line. Yeah, I feel pretty good about that one. Very competitive space, obviously, but the same could be said with pretty much every space is very, very competitive. PayPal, the first one that comes to mind. Going into this year, you know, Tesla was actually very attractive, uh, but you know, obviously the stock's gone up a lot. Uh, yeah. Amazon was very attractive going into this year, but that stock's uh, kind of gone beast mode a little bit here. So yeah, PayPal right now, I think is the probably the best risk reward in the stock market in terms of like thinking about, am I going to lose 50% in the stock? And what's the chance I double up my money in the stock over the next few years? I'm pretty sure you're fairly bullish on, on PayPal as well, right? I only recently got into PayPal. I actually don't own shares. I just own leaps on PayPal. I can have a more margined out bet. I can make outsized returns with relatively controlled risk on the leap side. And so I just generally am dipping my toes in because PayPal for me, for example, is just a trade. I recognize the opportunity, but PayPal personally is not a company that I want to be owning for three to five years. It's more of 12 to 24 month or even 36 month turnaround to see if they can double up. If I get 50 or 60 or 80 or, or 100% gains, I'm in and out. You know, yeah. so it's a swing trade for me more than anything else. Is that similar to how you're seeing it? Or are you comfortable holding for three to five years right now? I should be comfortable holding for many years. Uh, obviously, we'll see how things develop with the company over time. But I should feel fairly comfortable. But I, I do understand kind of where you're coming from. And I, I, even we had somebody in the private stock group that was talking about we're in the PayPal chat. They were mentioned exactly like you. They're like, I'm playing leaps on this one. I don't want to own it long term. But I do believe it's going to, you know, have a nice next, uh, you know, 12 to 18 months. So I don't have a super strong opinion uh, on the very, very short term around PayPal. But I just know I feel comfortable given the PE ratios, uh, yeah. given the growth rates. If, you know, the company ever starts shrinking revenues, that's a whole different scenario. Uh, but as long as they can continue to pound out growth for the next several years, I'm very, very comfortable with that, that position. Is PayPal what you're adding the most heavily right now, personally? Certainly of the last couple months here. Yep. That is the overwhelming favorite at the moment is uh, PayPal. I'll probably slow down my buys on PayPal in 2024. I still got at least a few more months of, of adding to PayPal pretty aggressively. When you think about your DCA, is it more of, you know, I'm going to buy from September until the end of the year, regardless of price? Or is it more if it hits 70 or $75, that's like my stop. That's my margin of safety area. Yeah. For me with PayPal, anything under a hundred is a okay. buy for me. Yeah. So, so, you know, unless PayPal just goes beast uh, here or suddenly, like I should have at least the remainder of this year to add PayPal. Yeah. So, and, and then I'll probably be about maxed out on PayPal shares because then I'll have a really good size position. So I probably won't want to take any more risk in it. Because at some point you get to a point where it's not intelligent to continue to add risk. The last question I have on, on PayPal, just because you said you'd be a buyer up until a hundred, what really is your profit taking range for this? Like, where do you see this going? Whew. Um, I mean, I think it could be a two or three hundred dollars stock again. I really okay. do. Um, three years? I think in the next five years. Yeah. My thought around PayPal is if they keep posting, let's call it high single digits or low double digits, let's talk about you know revenue growth. I they believe they're gonna be able to do a even bigger number on the bottom line. So let's say they grow 10% a year for the next five years, average revenue, I think they're gonna grow more than 10% bottom line. That puts us the situation where you're gonna to have to, at some point, give this company a much bigger valuation than you give it in terms of PE ratios. Like, you know, company trades, I think 11 times next year's numbers, 2024 numbers. Uh, that just doesn't make a lot of sense, in my opinion, for a company that's growing the way PayPal's growing right now. Now, if their growth rates ever stall, if they ever start going backwards, revenues ever go down, net income goes down, obviously, 
that two to three hundred dollar price isn't isn't going to work out, right? But if this company just pounds out solid numbers, they don't ever have to be the company that's growing revenues 20% again or 30% to reach the sort of valuation I think they're going to over the next few years. So that's kind of where I'm at with that one. And that's just why it's such a, a attractive kind of risk reward. And then I think about, okay, what are the chances it goes to 30 yeah. over this next few years? That's another thing I think about, right? Like the chance I lose 50% in the stock. There's only one of two ways to get there. One is the valuation is gets cut in half over the next five years and it's trading at a 6P or 5P. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Or two, the company just completely falls apart, their revenues plummet, their net income plummets, and their valuation plummets. And it just doesn't seem like that's that realistic. So I'm willing to take that risk. Do you have any opinion on their new CEO, Alex Chris? He was very important individual at Intuit. And I mean, Intuit's one of the best companies, you know, you could pretty much ever invest in over the past 10, 20 years. And he comes from a company that is loved by Wall Street. You know, Intuit's one of the most loved stocks. You know, I don't want to get my hopes up too much. Because mm -hmm. you never can in terms of these management teams. Because there, there's a good example of like, you know, Walgreens was a stock I was really excited about when Roz Brewer came over that company. She was a very well-established executive at Starbucks, worked super high up. She was like the number two, number three at Starbucks. She was CEO of Sam's Club. And I'm like, oh, she's going to come in and do a great job. Well, she just, you know, left the company. Mm -hmm. Walgreens and failed. And so that's why you never want to put too much weight in these new individuals. Let it play out. Let's see how the numbers are at this time next year. And um then we'll be able to start to judge, is this man doing a great job or is he not doing a great job? At least for me personally, I can't speak for everybody, but for me personally, I don't ever want to get overexposed to a stock. That's how I always remain in a pretty good place for my portfolios because, I mean, there's so many people that take so much, you know, and I'm, I know there's a lot of people out there that do this, but they put, you know, whatever amount, a big, you know, amount in, in one stock or two stocks. Man, you're preaching to the choir. I got 50% of Tesla. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, you know, <laughs> That's one of those that it, it definitely gets really, really risky, really, really fast. So I never like to have one stock make or break. That's the biggest mm -hmm. thing for me personally. It's because it's not a good feeling, you know, if you, yeah. but the good thing for you is at least you have it in a large company, not a smaller company, but uh, yeah, because I, you know, and I've been on YouTube since 2016, the amount of times I've heard like, if that stock goes down, you're ruined. And it's like, no, okay, no, like this is one position of many stocks I hold. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. I'll take my L and move on. Yeah, and ultimately, I mean, the, the reason I came to this conclusion of allocation is I used to have a more diversified portfolio, but right now I'm at a stage, Jeremy, where I'm like massive wealth accumulation phase. You know, I'm 29, I plan on, DCAing regularly for the foreseeable future. The portfolio has gotten to a place where it's definitely scary. It's like my monthly salary every other day. But at the same time, I think the, the cognitive load distribution is much more preferable this way. In other words, I cannot keep up with 20 names, man. I just can't do it. Yeah. But I can be an expert in two names and I can go down rivet by rivet in terms of Tesla and SoFi and break down every single piece of micro news that was posted on a blog post about either of those things. You know, it's that Warren Buffett thing where he's like, hey, it's fine to put all your eggs in one, one basket. Just watch that basket really close. <laughs> yeah. So I, I definitely sympathize with where you're coming from. Like I remember, you know, when I worked at Quick Trip as a manager of working, you know, right. 46 to 50 hours a week. Yeah. You know, back then in those days, I never owned more than 10 stocks. I was almost always in five, well, really like four to eight stocks most of the time. Because I mean, I felt like back then, and remember, this is back in my early 20s too. So I was kind of in a similar phase to you just before I had kids, before I had, you know, a lot of things. So yeah, back then, man, it was just, there's no way I could have probably kept up the way I do in the market now. You know, now my whole life is focused around the stock market. So I can listen to a million conference calls and do all these things. But I understand like when people say, man, I just don't have the time to keep up with 20 different stocks. Like it's unrealistic. Um, or to look into five new stocks a week or something like that. Like I just can't do it in respect. I understand that because if you work a job, you work, you know, 40, 50 hours a week, and especially if it's a demanding job, you need a certain amount of break, zone out, whatever it is. Some people watch Netflix, some people watch TikTok or sports or whatever. So you need that certain amount of just unwind. And then maybe you have 10 hours a week to maybe put into stocks, maybe 15 hours, something like that. But it's not like you got 40 or 50 hours to put into stocks. So I definitely understand that and kind of sympathize with that, that viewpoint. So a couple things on that. I would say that new people entering the market right now and they ask me what they should buy, the default answer that they usually get is diverse and if they have 10 or 50 or under 100k i would say you know just max five positions whereas myself i over diversified up until 100 
and then 100 to 200, I was just like, okay, I want to limit this down to having a good amount and maybe six names or so. And now mm-hmm. it's just, you know, I'm past the, the 250 mark and I'm like, okay, f- I have six figures just in Tesla alone. Right. And so I've sort of done it the opposite way where I've gotten way more concentrated as my total portfolio gets bigger. And just because I want to let the winners ride and it's like a, the Pareto principle, right? Like even if 90% fail, my top 10% convictions will pay off for all the winners in, in the future. I think my risk tolerance is really large because my time horizon is really long. So yeah. that's the one thing I'll say. The second thing I'll say is content creation and having this YouTube channel has forced me to watch over my Tesla and Sofi position like a hawk just right. because I need to make content or else the YouTube algorithm is going to punish me. And so I'm like, okay, what do I do for content for SoFi? It forces you to go into like super rabbit holes. Yeah, hundred percent. I definitely can understand that. Sometimes it's healthy. Sometimes it's not healthy. Yeah. <laughs> it just depends. And you're usually, you don't know it until uh, a year or two later. And then you, you, you look back and you're like, oh, that was healthy or that wasn't healthy. So yeah, uh, the unhealthy uh, side of it is when it, let's pivot. Palantir, too expensive right now? Ooh, uh, depends on your, your okay, time. I'm just not, I'm just not going to listen to this. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, it depends upon uh, your, your your time frame. To be honest, I mean, if you're just judging off short term, sure, it looks expensive. If you're judging off of a longer term, you know, kind of thought process, I don't think so. I mean, I think their growth rates are probably the smallest right now that we'll see for the next several years. I could be wrong about that, but I, I don't think it's a, a, a stretch to imagine this company gets back to 18%, 20%, or 25% plus growth rates as far as top line. Bottom line should expand faster. I don't think the stock's super expensive. Obviously, it's not as cheap as it was, you know, at the beginning of the year. But um, yeah, I, and I have I have different cases around Palantir as well in terms of my bearish case, bullish case. I think the company's going to be a money printer. I really do. I think we're we're at infant stage of profitability. We're inning one right now. You're going to look at this company three years out, five years out, and just laugh at how not profitable the company really is nowadays and uh, compared to what the company will be in many years. So, But in terms of me, it's certainly one of those stocks I watch my risk levels. I have less than $100,000 in that stock. I have maybe 80 k or so or 90 k So it's one of those that I don't want to risk the farm on Palantir, but I do want that, that upside potential. So that's kind of where I'm at with Palantir. But I'd love to hear your perspective and opinion too. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's definitely a multiple that has been added on just from the AI boom, which is sort of this macro term du jour. I think 2021 was all about metaverse and 2023 is all about AI. One of the things that um, I've been thinking about quite a bit, actually, is whether I want to pivot out of Palantir and just allocate more into SoFi or more into PayPal, just because I I doubled my Palantir position the day they announced AIP which was seven and a half or eight dollars a share. I bought initially at like eighteen dollars, something like that, or seventeen dollars on the way down. I doubled my position at like seven, eight. And so I could roll out of Palantir right now. I probably should just to simplify my portfolio just in general. The reason I haven't so far is the long-term bull case like you highlighted. I also think that in Q3, the S&P 500 inclusion, which is basically why they also got that buyback allocation just so that they can ensure their EPS profitable. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to help them a lot. It's going to allow a lot of funds to funnel cash and then basically boost up the stock. But at the same time, man, I think that if NVIDIA shows one sign of weakness, all of these AI stocks are going to get hit pretty hard. And right now it's, it's, you know, sunshine and rainbows, that honeymoon period. But I've just been burned on these other cycles. You know, you had NFTs, you had the metaverse and you had, and now it's like AI. And I don't know if if this is something that we are stealing forward profits from future years because there's still maybe a period of time that's execution risk based until we actually see the thing that we're being promised today, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think a lot of people have tried to like kind of put it into that category of like comparing it to the metaverse or NFTs and these sorts of things. And I don't know. I just don't think that's the best comp just because, you know. I mean, how many people were actually using NFTs or even cared about that, to be honest? Like, right. unless you were super in that niche group of folks that cared about that. Like, you know, I don't I don't think Jensen was talking about that. Snowflake CEO wasn't really talking about that. Palantir, you know, every company in, in the world is thinking AI. Every company in the world, top level executives from Apple to Meta to every company is really thinking about AI approaches. You know, I just mm-hmm. read something, I think the other day, Apple spending million do- millions of dollars a day on AI, right? And there was and it's something interesting 
interesting happened on the Snowflake conference call where they asked uh, Frank Slootman and the other executive there, when's it going to hit on the software side? And they basically said 2024. I think everybody got too excited thinking, oh, the software side is going to start hitting in 23. And it's just not realistic. I mean, this is really like hardware build out year. Right. And then we should start to see some revenue start to you know funnel in in 24 for these companies, whether it be Palantir or anybody else out there. I think everybody's just got too excited too fast. It seems like a space that's not going anywhere because at the end of the day, if these com- you know if, if Palantir can save a company fifty million dollars a year and the company has to spend twenty million dollars a year on the product, it's it's going to be a no brainer, right? So we'll see how it shakes out. I think there's something real long term there. I'll, I'll really uh, don't get me wrong, I absolutely agree with that. I don't think AI is a dud. I just think that. Right now, it's sort of an unmolded slab of clay to the layman. I work in the tech sector. I understand the productivity benefits that like I use GPT every day for for my own like daily tasks. And I look like a machine to my colleagues because I can get stuff done in a fraction of the time. But at the same time, I'm on client and customer calls every single day where I'm trying to sell our own AI features from our software perspective. And it's not really AI. It's just like an if this, then that model or, or, you know, some type of machine learning model. And they just don't understand how to apply it into their regular life. It's just like, oh, I, I heard this thing makes it easier for me. I just don't know exactly how it does that. And so I think that there's going to be a natural gap between what these companies are talking about today and when the actual productivity gains are going to be seen from the average office worker in 12 months. Yeah. Okay. So what I think the best comp is personally is I remember I got in the market 08, 09, you know, that was kind of like my infant stage of like trying to figure this stuff out. And then I really started getting involved in 2010, 2011. And I remember back in 2010, 2011, even in 2012, everybody was starting to talk about the cloud. Right. And everybody on CNBC was talking about the cloud and who's going to be the big cloud players. And a lot of people didn't even know, like, what is the cloud? Like, what is this cloud thing everybody's talking about? Uh, But you heard a lot of executives speaking about cloud, very similar to how everybody's kind of using AI as a buzzword. Everybody at that time was using cloud as a buzzword. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really clear who was going to be for sure the biggest winners in that space. Obviously, nowadays, it's it's very clear who was the winners and and not winners, right? But um, the cloud ended up becoming a key component of every single company in the world. Like, I don't think anybody exists without cloud. Even if you have a small business, you're likely on the cloud in some form, right? Either through Dropbox or AWS or somebody. I think that's where we're going with AI, where it's going to be incorporated into every single business in the world over the next 10 years, though. It's not going to be like an overnight thing. It's going to be more companies adapt, more companies, more companies. The spend will go up immensely as years kind of tick on. No different than the cloud. In the early days, you know, companies would spend very small amounts of money on the cloud. And then as they grew bigger and their cloud demands grew bigger, obviously, uh, you know, the beneficiaries like AWS, Google Cloud and others, you know, benefited huge. And so that's what I think is going to play out here. It's going to be a big 10, 20 year cycle and it's going to just going to be growth, growth, growth. The growth rates are going to seem insane at first, but then over time, it will be something that the numbers just start to become really big and the growth rate slow. Honestly, I think that's a really good comparable. And I don't even think it's going to take 10 to 20 years. Like it's going to be way less. Like you see these exponential growth curves in terms of adoption rates of new technologies. I don't know if you've ever seen this chart, but it's basically this chart where it shows like the time to adopt in, in the average household. And it goes like the refrigerator, the radio, color TV or whatever. And it just gets incrementally faster and faster because they're all derivatives on each other, right? And from a technology stack perspective, AI is just going to be way faster than that because like I grew up, I didn't have a cell phone, let alone a smartphone. Like I didn't have a cell phone until until late we grew up in a generation where the internet when we were kids it wasn't a thing or it was just starting out and now yeah. we're at a place where we're introducing ai we are much more willing to adopt new technologies just because we've had to adopt so many in the past 100 percent, yeah 100 percent, yeah no no disagreements when it comes to that 100 percent Let's pivot. I want to touch on all of the stocks that we share. Revolve was my third biggest position at some point. I sold out of half of my position back in February at, I think, $26 or $27. And thankfully, I did because it just hit 52-week lows last week. I think it hit like $13. Company is still executing. What's your thoughts there, just on a high level? Yeah, I I like the company long term. I think they've been in a little bit of a tough place short term. Not executing certainly as well as they have in the past. She's in a great place. Management team, you know, the two gentlemen that lead the company have done a really good job. Yeah. 
Yeah, those gentlemen are doing a great job, you know, building this company from literally nothing into, you know, uh, a big player in the market. So I think they'll be fine long term. I think they're just in a, a bad spot short term. That's kind of my views. My views are 2024, we start to see the business increase again. If the business doesn't get in a better place in 24, I'll be much more concerned. But for right now, it's certainly not a panic situation for me in regards to Revolve. Well, you were buying actually back in 2020 when everything was shut down and this Revolve, I think, hit like $7 or something like that. I think my average right now is like 14, 15. I think I just slightly hit red. I remember when this thing hit 80 and I yep. am still slapping myself for not <laughs> selling out a portion at that time, but that's yeah. time market, right? I can't like, how, how am I going to know that? Um, yeah. So what do you think? Do you think there's going to be a catalyst or is it just the economy sort of bounces back? Uh, like what about if we have a recession in 24? Yeah, I think if we have some sort of recession where unemployment goes up substantially, that could be right. bad. But I think at the end of the day, it's very important for folks to understand like how bad the consumer really got hit, you know, over the last two years with real wages. We finally actually have real wages starting to increase in the United States again for the first time. And it's very minimal. So a lot of people aren't feeling it yet, but it has started to go up rather than go down. We had real wages going down for years, you know, and we had such an increase in real wages from 2015 to right before Rona. I mean, it was it was extraordinary, the, the increase in real wages we had for years. And so I think they've really been affected by that negatively. And I think a lot of companies have been affected by even companies like Nike and Foot Locker and stocks that, you know, you wouldn't even think are that risky, you know, or have been just very negatively hit. My belief is the consumer gets in a better place because inflation is starting to finally take a back seat. Wages seem to be still going up, which I think is going to be helpful to the consumer. I don't know how helpful it is to businesses or companies. You know, you look at what's going on with the United Auto Workers uh, Union. You look what's going on with UPS recently. So we'll, we'll see where all things shake out. But if anything, I, I expect the consumer to be in a much better place in 24, regardless if a recession or not, but in a better place in 24 than they were certainly in uh, 23 this year or even in 22. So... We'll see. So just on a macro, you're bullish in terms of a bounce back in 24. I mean, I know that right now the, you know, the market front runs the economy by quite a bit. And yeah. so we're looking at a Fed pause and e even a, a Fed rate cut towards mid 24, let's say. And the market is going to, I mean, we'll see what CPI comes in. Uh, I think it's tomorrow. But yep. essentially, if, if the Fed pauses towards the end of the year, I mean, they have to project more hawkish than they really are just because they can't project dovish because then people will go wild. <laughs> so I get I understand the game. But yeah. if they pause towards the end of the year, it's it's clear skies from an uncertainty perspective for the market. I just don't know how telling that is of the underlying economy and the corresponding earnings reports of some of these companies. Yeah, I agree with that. It's it's a funky time. And that's why I'm like, I'm hedging going into 2024 because I, I see a lot of different scenarios. I see a scenario where the consumer gets in a much better place and things are good in 24. I see a scenario where we have an actual recession in 24 and the Fed lags of finally catch up with us in, in, a, in a substantial way. So it's been one of the hardest times to judge macroeconomics, I think, in history. And the main reason because of the stimulus. I mean, uh, we never seen the government pump money like that ever. And then on top of that, you add on the, the reopening of the economy and how much of a benefit that was that for several years, as you, you know, obviously got a lot of those jobs back and leisure, hospitality and, and industries like that. So it's, it's a really hard time to forecast, I got to say. That's why I'm going into 24 hedged and uh, we'll see we'll see where things shake out. Talk to me about your hedge a little bit. Yeah, so I got a few different hedging strategies, but usually I'm trying to hedge thinking what stocks would get really hit hard if the market gets hit really hard and the economy simultaneously gets hit really hard. I have Apple hedge, hedge on right now, puts on Apple uh, from a few different strike prices that expired in 2024. I have some Toll Brothers ones because Toll Brothers is a stock that when the stock market gets hit, Toll Brothers gets hit hard. It's the stock that recently hit all-time highs. I was looking at that and I just thought that was a pretty attractive opportunity. If the stock market gets hit in any major way, essentially Toll Brothers customer base starts pulling back huge because they have a, a higher end uh, clientele base. They usually sell homes that are a million dollars plus. So there's just a massive pullback there. I have one on Polaris. Polaris is a stock that some people might know or not know, but it's basically a fun company. Uh, you know, you buy ATVs from them and snowmobiles and all types of fun stuff. And certainly with interest rates, and a lot of people buy those on loans, with interest rates going up, don't matter what happens, there's a pullback going on for a company like that. 
But if you're talking about unemployment going up or recession worries, that sort of company gets hit. So I have a few different ones um, other than that as well, but those are some of the ones that come to mind just in case. And a little hedging can go a long way done properly because, man, obviously when you're you're executing on, on things that are like one year out put options, I mean, if things got really bad, the, the increase on those put options can be 3x, 5x, 10x in a pretty quick amount of time. Hopefully they all expire worthless because that'll be my stocks are likely doing well. If they made a bunch of money, that means things got ugly. So... You mentioned the hedge with Apple puts. How underwhelmed are you by the Apple event earlier today? <laughs> I was exactly what I was expecting. Exactly <laughs> what I was expecting. Yeah. The one thing that scared me is that pink pink iPhone, man. That might be the hit. That might screw my Apple puts right there, man. The Barbie yeah. iPhone. <laughs> so I have a very good friend, actually, and, and he also bought Apple puts. And I was just like, really? Apple puts? I didn't see it. Yeah. And then some. I saw this thing circulating on X where it showed foot traffic somewhere in Asia. And it was the Huawei store chock full right across was the Apple store, literally not a single soul. And wow. yeah, I'll, I'll send it to you if I can find okay. it after this, but I sent that to him and I was like, okay, maybe puts a really good idea on Apple. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, Apple's been the biggest buyer of Apple stock for the last couple of years. So yeah, that, how that stock has been going up. Yeah, you can't expect Apple to tank too hard. It's one of those yeah. stocks, you know, maybe it goes down 20, 30% if we get some sort of market pullback. And and also their numbers aren't too exciting, which I don't expect them to be very exciting. But uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those that is hard to get down 50% now because you got the Buffett put on the stock, right? Where Buffett holds so many shares and he doesn't seem like he's interested in selling at all. And then you got Apple always buying back so many shares. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it creates not the best dynamic for huge downside. We'll, we'll see how it all shakes out. So far, it's going really well, but you never know. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, even today, I think it went down like 2% plus or something like that. I wasn't following too closely, but yeah. I know it went down from that event. What are your thoughts on the new, uh, the Apple competitor to the Quest? Uh, what are they called? Vision Pros, something like that? Yeah, I think they went way too high with the price point. And I, I spoke about this when it first came out, but they basically did like the opposite of what Steve Jobs used to like to do, where Steve Jobs would usually come out with something lower price point that the masses could afford and then get as many developers as possible on it to develop. Whereas Apple's kind of gone with an interesting different technique here where they're going super high end. Right. But the problem is, you know, how many people are going to be able to buy that nearly $4,000 device? And are going to be willing to part with that money for something that I think a lot of people view as not a need versus Meta's approaches. Let's sell something at three or four hundred dollars, five hundred dollars. The masses can afford it. And um, let's get a lot of people using these. Let's get 15 million, 20 million, 30 million. So we'll see whose approach works better over time. But I mean, to push back or to present the counter argument, like I think the target audience is different. The Apple device, I think, is more geared towards developers to start building software on those devices, probably what you'll see is next year, you will get a mid-market comparable. Mm. But after that, you've already had like an app store, you already have software that's built, being built. And if I'm a software developer, then I don't care if it's $4,000, it's my company that's gonna be buying it because I'm building yeah. it. That's a good point, that's a good point. At some point, Apple's going to have to go to a more affordable price point. Like this is absolutely, and especially with those new technology, because the, the folks that really make new technology cool is young people, you know, people under 30 for the most part. If we think about who were all the people that were using iPhone in the early days and iPad, it was right. high school kids and college kids and just younger folks in general, like business professionals thought iPhone was Blackberry. a joke. Yeah. yeah. Blackberry. Yeah. So yeah, that's where it's going to be really interesting to see when Apple pivots to attract the younger folks. Cause I'm just like, it seems like Meta's got a better approach to attract people that are younger because the price point alone is just such a substantial difference. So I want to just touch on, on one other aspect of something that you said earlier, you talked about just the fed pumping into the economy and what's that done, you know, for inflation and, and just the unwanted byproducts that we're seeing now, or we're paying the consequences now. What's your stance on, on Bitcoin in general as a result of that? Yeah. My stance on Bitcoin is I feel like Bitcoin's a little bit in no man's land right now. It's in a little bit of a lost state is the best way I could put Bitcoin right now, because I mean, the, the, the talk for Bitcoin for years was this is what we're going to use to transact. And it just yeah. hasn't come to fruition or even remotely close, right? right? Then it was, it's a store of wealth. And obviously, 
it hasn't been a very good store of wealth, right? I, that's why I feel like Bitcoin's just kind of lost right now. I know there's they're trying to get some, uh, I believe, some ETFs passed. Uh, yeah. We'll see what happens with that. But yeah, I feel like Bitcoin's just in complete no man's land. Obviously, all the, the I mean, how many crypto exchanges went down last year? That was not obviously good. That yeah. is just kind of bearish for the whole crypto industry after going through that situation. So yeah, that's kind of my opinion on, on Bitcoin right now is it's just kind of in no man's land. And it might be there for a little bit in terms of just, you know, floundering around in 20k to 30k. That mm -hmm. might just be situation for a bit until there's some sort of new major catalyst that kind of gets it out of that. You don't own any, any crypto, right? Uh, I used to until all those damn crypto exchanges went down and I lost all my money. So. No. <laughs> no. As of right now, no, because yeah, unfortunately. Wow. I did not know that. Sorry to hear that. Uh, that yeah. sucks. Um, well, happens. Yeah. <laughs> it's like rule number one, man. Keep it in your own wallet. Yeah, I know. And a lot <laughs> of us learn that hard, man. The amount of yeah. people I know that lost uh, significant portions of their net wealth, you know, friends of mine and whatnot. Jeez. Uh, you know, crazy, crazy. And there was a lot of people kind of giving crypto a chance. Like I've never been the biggest crypto person. I think everybody knows that, right? Yeah. And I kind of gave it a chance. And then all of a sudden, all those crypto companies are going down left and right. And it's just like, yeah, it's just not a good luck. It's no different than people giving the stock market a chance and like Robinhood fails and Fidelity fails and TD Ameritrade. And, and people are like, what the hell, man? Like, like yeah. yeah, that's going to be something that weighs on crypto for years. It's not like that's magically going to erase from people's minds. It's going to be there for years. Is so. crypto something you'd be willing to give another chance to in the future? Potentially, uh, but no time soon. That's the thing. Yeah. No time soon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things. It's like when when you finally gave something a chance and then it, it treats you like that, it's like, uh, yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But the I think the biggest thing with crypto is you got to see it in the real world. You know, once you see yeah. these things, that's the great thing with, with stocks and, and with actual companies. Yeah. Is you see it in the real world. You know, if you like SoFi, you can go experience SoFi now. I remember specifically, this is like 2021. I remember being in the gym with Graham one day and uh, we were talking about fintech and he was telling me about some private company's valuation. And I just remember telling him like fintech is the biggest bubble. It's the biggest freaking bubble because they were valuing, oh gosh, like you could get like, I think they were valuing at, each user being worth a hundred or a thousand dollars or something, some crazy amount, maybe it's five hundred dollars. And I'm like, this is stupid. And uh, it's crazy because I wish I would have placed some short bets on on everything fintech because literally everything would have printed money. But mm -hmm. uh, the bubble's popped uh, now; it's over. And so, in regards to PayPal, Square, Robinhood, everything, SoFi, it's already popped. And so, the good news is now for these companies is I think there's definitely a there's not like that scariness in my opinion anymore. Now at this point in time of like, oh man, these stocks gonna go down 50, 60, 70%. Right. Like there certainly was years ago. Now it's just a question of like, is it dead money for a bit or is it you know a, a time period where we're gonna start going back up, so. And that's a lesson that I've sort of learned through osmosis of being in the market now for what, like six years? that a lot of times the hype will really front run whatever the execution is or the implementation, let's say, even if it is fintech, even if it is crypto, even if it is AI, like there's always going to be a hype bubble and mm -hmm. then a period of time, which is like this, you know, lull or chasm, let's say, and then the actual time when it gets implemented and you actually start to see the, the fruit from that initial hype, right? So like, oh, metaverse yeah. is coming. You're actually going to be able to go into this virtual reality, blah, blah, blah. That might be the case in 10 years. But mm. Facebook changed their name like two years ago because <laughs> yeah. Yeah. the last sort of topic that I wanted to cover is the last stock that we share, Corsair. Mm. Definitely one of my favorite names just from a product perspective. I have a couple of their gear right now. I have the stream deck right here. But I mean, look, the stock hasn't been really doing all that much. It is a hardware play. It is mm -hmm. something benefited quite a bit from COVID. I mean, everybody was decking out their work from home setups. It's something that is seasonal. Holiday is their biggest season what's your what's your take on them yeah corsair's okay it's not the company i thought it was when i first got into it i think now at this point in time it's a very attractive risk reward i think it'd be a good stock over time is it some stock that has massive upside i don't really see it unless they have some sort of game changing product it's just a company that's going to put up good numbers i think they should be profitable every single year moving forward and very substantially profitable you know great products obviously i mean i've never really heard anybody say bad stuff about corsair's products or 
they're just a tremendous company. They execute. Unfortunately, they had that huge pull forward. The good yeah. news is we don't have to deal with that anymore. Like those numbers are all in the past. There's no such thing as a pull forward anymore. And so I think the company should be able to get back to nice, consistent growth in top and bottom line. And I think that will be very helpful for the valuation of the company as well, that people can be confident that they're going to grow in a certain range. But yeah, it's just kind of like one of those stocks I hold that it's just kind of like, me, you know, I think it'll be fine uh, over the next few years. But I, it's not one of those that really gets me super excited. Let's just call it that. So you're not you're not a buyer. You're not a seller. You're just hold. Yeah, right now with Corsair, it's pretty much just a hold. You know, if I think about this, my favorite stocks to buy right now, yeah, it's, unfortunately, it's not up there. It's a tough one, though. I'm just trying. I'm trying to like see how they ever command a bigger valuation in terms of PE ratio because mm -hmm. they just seem to be stuck in kind of like hardware space. It seems like yeah. you know, and if they ever want to really command a much bigger valuation, they're going to have to get into software in a much greater extent. It just doesn't seem like they really have it to get into software in any substantial way. Yeah, it just seems like they'll always kind of be one of those companies that trades at a forward PE of you know, let's call it twelve to maybe. 18 somewhere in there uh, yeah and at a high level of you know i think that's fine you nailed it i think growth had been pulled forward and growth rates have fallen they're recovering now as of the latest quarters average selling prices are rising for their products they're sustainably profitable they're paying down their debt yeah. you know their margins there's hardware margins but they're also increasing steadily over time they're the big, biggest market player in pc gaming so it's really if you believe that pc gaming is going to be on the rise and overall if you believe that there's going to be more gaming titles in 2024 and if that space is going to see a massive expansion as well i mean that that could be the only sort of macro tailwind that i could see for corsair but what you see is what you get with the business there's the options contract for innovation i would say is fairly low compared to some of these other names yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, certainly whatever Apple does and whatever Meta does, I think my personal opinion is Meta Meta uh, Quest Three should be fairly popular. I think it'll be much more popular in the second generation. So I think that's a potential competitive threat maybe to Corsair over time is uh, VR gaming. But obviously they can create things and get in that space in some sort of way, in some sort of fashion, if that expands. So they'll yeah. figure out a way. Andy Paul led that company for I don't know hundred years now. He, he, yeah. They always have found a way to, you know, find new products and services that they can provide to the marketplace. So I'm sure he would figure out something. Okay. Well, I don't want to take up too much more time. I think we covered a lot of ground and I really enjoyed it. And uh, I definitely want to hear back once you try it. So far product, I'm very invested in that, in that journey and your experience in general. And Jeremy, honestly, thank you so much for, for just being on. This was really fun for me at least. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was it was great. And I, I love to chat these stocks. So I appreciate you taking the time to have me on today. So thank you. Perfect. All right. Talk soon. Smash a thumbs up. <laughs>